perform functions the same as or similar to those performed under Section 33 by a court in the state. Helpfully, we don't have uh, Section 33 here. Oh, do we? Where is it? Oh, sorry, I'm talking... Oh, wonderful. Tab 140 of the... That's much better. Thank you. Section 33. We go to tab 140 of the supplementary bundle. What you will see is that section 33 is the section that gives the power to issue the EAW. So the Irish definition of judicial authority expressly includes any person authorised in the issuing state to issue a European arrest warrant. And certainly, I mean, you're not contending, as I apprehend, that there's any violation of Article 5 in, in respect of such a scheme. I'm not, Lord. No. I'm not, Lord. I'm, I'm not no. suggesting that there is no power in one state to, uh, to agree to surrender individuals to another on the basis of a warrant issued by a public prosecutor. I don't suggest that. I accept that there is such a power. The point that I make is that it is not a matter that is required by the framework decision, and it is not uh, the legislative choice that was made by the UK Parliament, because the UK Parliament chose a different route, which was to insist upon judicial authority as a safeguard. That's, that's the point. But doesn't this involve your conceding that judicial authority within the meaning of the framework de de <coughs> decision is capable of being as widely construed as the Irish have construed it? My Lord, no. Because what the Irish are saying is we will deem to be a judicial authority any authority in the member state that has been designated to perform this function. So if the member state designated, for example, a private prosecutor, an individual who wished to bring a private prosecution as, as being able to issue an EAW, under the Irish statute, that would be sufficient. Or if it was the Secretary of State for Justice. doesn't matter who, or, or simply a police constable. Right. All that the Irish statute requires is that the person is designated in, the mem in, in another member state. That's all it requires. Your submission is that the framework decision doesn't forbid yes, my Lord. individual member states going beyond. Indeed, my Lord, it, it actively encourages them to do so if they wish. It sets a floor. And, and it sets a floor of minimum cooperation, and the floor of minimum cooperation is based on an EAW issued by a judicial authority. And of course, one of the parties negotiating that agreement was the United Kingdom, which we submit was not prepared to agree to anything greater. I mean, I'm not saying it takes it very far, but it all, all I'm, I mean, it just strikes me that the, the term judicial authority is being interpreted by the Irish. I mean, they think it's a term that is capable of being given this extended meaning. You may say it's extended beyond that that it bears in the framework decision, but it's merely a term which is capable of that extension. Well, but, my Lord, if one accepts that judicial authority in the framework decision means any authority designated by the state to issue a warrant then the term judicial authority is wholly emptied of content because all that it is saying is the member state may designate any authority it chooses to issue a warrant and that shall be deemed to be a judicial authority. It, the, the phrase judicial there is adding nothing. That's the point. The answer to Lord Brown's point is that you can define a word to mean anything. Yes. In, in my if, if, next if, sentence, if, if, black means white. Indeed, and the, and the Irish are defining it here to mean any authority that's been designated in a state. But it doesn't, of course, follow from that that that's what the framework decision requires. And, and our submission, for all the reasons I've, I've gone on for much too long, probably, is that it, it can't possibly mean that. Yes. And, and, and what is striking is the difference between the 2003 Act in the United Kingdom and the 2003 Act in Ireland. 
It's also striking that their executing authority is the High Court. Well, absolutely, my lady, because you'd, you would expect that from a common law jurisdiction. But they are applying a much more trusting approach to their European partners than the UK Parliament chose to do, because the UK Parliament set a clear standard, and that was a standard of judicial authority. Uh, just for the Court's note, this provision was considered by the Irish High Court in the case of Alta Revisius. We don't need to turn it up. It's at volume 3, tab 34, page 2714 in the electronic numbering. And at page 2721, the High Court reaches uh, the obvious conclusion on the construction of this 2003 Act. So our submission is that you have to look at what the framework decision requires and not what it permits, and that the United Kingdom was only obliged to implement what it required and did so quite uh, deliberately to the minimum extent. And there may be other states that have taken a broader approach, but that has no bearing on the proper construction of the uh, United Kingdom Act. That brings me then to my next topic, which is what are the implications of what we say is the right construction of the 2003 Act for the status of the Swedish prosecutor in this case? And we submit that the status of the Swedish prosecutor is very clear. This is a simple case. And it's a simple case because the role and function of the Swedish prosecutor was expressly considered by the European Commission of Human Rights in the Skutrom uh, case, which we've already looked at, at volume 6, tab 57, page 3398 of the electronic numbering. And there, uh, as we've already seen, is an analysis of the role of the Swedish prosecutor and a clear finding that the Swedish prosecutor is not independent of the parties, but is a public prosecutor in the sense we understand public prosecutor. The I same, don't believe that's, that, that's not contentious, is it? I don't believe it is, my lord. The same message comes over loud and clear from the Swedish evaluation report. Uh, this is at volume 11 of the authorities bundle, tab 94. And if uh, a court goes to page 4396 in the um, electronic numbering, it's page 4 of the internal numbering, you see the heading, the authorities and the legal basis. And there is an analysis there of Swedish courts, the Swedish Public Prosecution Service, the legal department within the Office of the Prosecutor General, and local prosecution offices. And in particular, at the bottom of 4397, local prosecution offices perform prosecutorial tasks and lead criminal investigations Sweden does not follow the so-called investigating judge model, and Swedish public prosecutors have very strong powers compared with the situation existing in other member states, may decide on any kind of measures during investigations, including coercive measures, with some exceptions, e.g. phone surveillance or detection or detention. And then the National Police Board, which as we know is authorised to issue conviction warrants, is dealt with at page 4398. The Central Administrative and Supervisory Authority for the Police Service headed by the National Police Commissioner, who's appointed by the government, in, and responsible for international police work and the central police records. The National Police Board is responsible for issuing EAWs in conviction cases. Now, we submit that there is no possible interpretation of the framework decision under which the Swedish National Police Board could be considered to be a judicial authority. Even if the divisional court in this case was right, to take as the start and end of this case the original commission proposal with the definitions that were contained in it. That proposal made it clear that it did include public prosecutors, but it didn't include police. So in any view, Sweden has failed properly to implement the framework decision. The only question is how badly. Sorry, before I leave that, there's just one more point. Uh, going to page 4401. 
There's a description here of the Swedish law in relation to the issuing of an EAW. It's page 9 of the internal numbering. In issuing an EAW, the Swedish authorities apply a proportionality test. An EAW may only be issued if it's justified, considering the nature and seriousness of the crime and the circumstances in general, thereby taking into account the harm to the individual and the estimated time and costs that may follow. If the requested person is under 18, an EAW may only be issued if it concerns serious criminality or the youth has a strong connection with Sweden or some other special reason for requesting a surrender to Sweden. In prosecution cases, it's the responsibility of the prosecutor to assess whether or not it's legal, appropriate and proportionate to issue an EAW. Now, the reason I show that to the court is that there was some suggestion before the divisional court, and there is some uh, perhaps tentative suggestion in Ms. Montgomery's case, but there's no problem in substance in this case, because even if the Swedish prosecutor is not a judicial authority, a detention order had been made by the Svea Court of Appeal, and all that the Swedish prosecutor was doing was converting that to a European arrest warrant. Now, we submit that that is wrong as a matter of principle, and under Swedish law, it is quite clear that there, are, there is a further uh, discretionary judgment to be reached, a proper evaluation to be reached, concerning the proportionality, not of detaining somebody, but of requiring their extradition across a frontier. And that is a different decision from a, uh, the issue of a detention order. It, it wasn't quite clear to me whether, under Swedish law, it was a condition yeah. precedent to the issue of the European arrest warrant that a, a detention order should be obtained from the court in absentia. Well, well that's not clear to me either. I couldn't quite see the it, point it, it of maybe, going to the court. Maybe that Miss Montgomery can, can, can yes. interpret. She, she says that was the evidence plan. Yes, I suspected that was she the evidence plan. She says what? She says it is a condition precedent. Yeah. I'm not in a position to dispute that. But whether it is or it isn't... What, that there's a court order for detention? For detention. But whether it is or it isn't, this provision makes it clear that there is a separate question, which is not whether a person should be detained, but whether they should be extradited. That's a different question. Can I now turn to the divisional court decision itself and identify what we submit are its flaws? That decision is in the core bundle, page 141. And the reasoning on this issue begins at paragraph 33. It's page 150 in electronic numbering, page 16 of the hard copy. Paragraph 33, the court summarises its task to interpret the 2003 Act in accordance with the guidance of the House of Lords. We don't disagree with that. <coughs> then at 34, they say they don't gain much assistance from Hansard, given the broad category of authorities and the practice under the 1989 Act to which the ministers refer. And they refer to the case of van der Holst, uh, in which a public prosecutor to the District Court of Amsterdam issued an arrest warrant, uh, and that was the basis for extradition under the old 1870 Act. Now, I do just want to turn this case up. The van der Holst case is at Volume 3 of the Authorities Bundle, Tab 27. This, of course, is a case under the old 1870 Extradition Act. Under that Act, a request for extradition is not made by any judicial authority. It is made by a state and supported by evidence which may include an arrest warrant or other judicial decision. And in this case, there was an arrest warrant from a public prosecutor supporting a request for extradition, and the argument was that that didn't fall within the scope of the Act. If the court goes to page 2574, you can see the uh, decision that was made. In the middle of the page, page 10 of the internal numbering, 
2574 and the electronic numbering 